Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Gary Schaefer, the CEO of the Tulsa City County Library, we want to welcome you to the Hardesty Regional Library. My name is Kimberly Johnson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Tulsa City County Library. Today, we are gathered in Connors Cove, our wonderful children's theater. I am so delighted that you are all able to join us for this morning's Festival of Words Writers Award. The award is presented every other year as a part of the American Indian Festival of Words, which is presented annually by the Tulsa City County Library's American Indian Resource Center and the Tulsa Library Trust. If you have not had the chance to visit the American Indian Resource Center yet, please stop by for a visit. It is located at the Zarrow Regional Library in West Tulsa. We are very proud of our American Indian Resource Center as it is nationally recognized for its programs to preserve and promote appreciation for our state's American Indian heritage. We are also proud of our center's coordinator, Teresa Reynolds. Is she here? In the okay, let's give her a round of applause anyway. <laughs> Through her work in the center, Teresa has contributed greatly to the Tulsa area Indian community and has helped tremendously in the preservation of native languages. This past year, Teresa worked with the Cherokee Nation and Mango Languages, which is a library database, to offer Cherokee language courses. It is now possible to learn the Cherokee language through Mango's online courses available at the Tulsa City County Library and libraries across the nation. Today's festival is an example of the, exp is an example of the exemplary programming that has led to our national recognition. I would like now to take a moment to acknowledge the sponsors who have helped make the Festival of Words Writers Award possible through their generosity. They are the Tulsa Library Trust, the Maxine and Jack Zarrell Family Foundation, Cherokee Builders Inc., Dr. Frank and Mary Shaw, the Tulsa City County Library's American Indian Resource Center, and the Tulsa City County Library's Staff Association. Additional, additional support was provided by the Mary Kay Chapman Foundation and the George Kaiser Family Foundation. Can we give them all a hand, please, for their support? I would also like to take a few moments to acknowledge special guests in the audience today. We have Judy Randall, our library commissioner. In the, welcome, Judy. We also have with us today Miss Indian Oklahoma, Jordan Harmon. Where's Jordan? There she is. And we have Junior Miss Indian Oklahoma, Lindsay Harjo. The Tulsa City County Library strongly believes that libraries change lives. In fact, one of the ways we do this is by recognizing and sharing the rich culture and history of, of American Indians. Before we start the program, you should have been, received an index card. And on the index card, that's, you will write your question for, our, for the later portion of the question and answers. If you have not received an index card, please raise your hand. We'll make sure you get one. Anyone not receive an index card on the way in? We have two people in the front row. If we can get index cards for them, we would, I would appreciate it. Those will be coming shortly. Now, please join me in welcoming our Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Mark Wilson. Good morning. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful Saturday out there. We're blessed with beautiful weather. It's still winter here in Northeast Oklahoma, but what a beautiful day to honor an outstanding gentleman, a scholar, an artist, if you will. And I just want to acknowledge and say thank you to my brothers over there. Let's give a round of applause to our singers. It's always a blessing to hear those beautiful songs being rendered from that drum. And just honored to have our, our, our singers here with us this morning to, to set the tone for a beautiful day. 
Like Kim said, my name is Mark Wilson, and I'm honored uh, to be here today to share some information with you about this wonderful festival. I'm a member of the American Indian Resource Advisory Council for Tulsa Public Library. What a beautiful library. Has, is this anybody's first time here at Connors Cove or Hardesty? All right, how about, a, let's give Tulsa Public Libraries a round of applause too. They do an outstanding job for all of our communities that call the greater Tulsa area home. And this is just an example. Today is gonna to be an outstanding day there's activities throughout the, uh, once we conclude here, we encourage you to, to stay around if, if possible. Uh, Miss Moni Horsechief, uh, World Indian Taco Champion, will be serving her fares outside. There'll be activities throughout the afternoon. So again, we know that your Saturdays are extremely, extremely busy, and we're just honored uh, and thrilled that each and every one of you are here with us this morning. Family is the backbone. It's the foundation of our culture. We're given substance, nurtured, and sustained by family. Kinship goes beyond family and is the connection we feel to the world at large and everything in it. That's an old uh, Lakota saying. And as I woke up this morning, I was going through some notes thinking about what I might offer to each and every one of you today, but in all actuality, we're here to honor our honoree, Mr. Bruchak. And at this time, I would like to ask him just to please stand and let's give uh, Mr. Bruchak a round of applause, please. We will have more information to share about this gentleman. Again, I mentioned this scholar, this artist, but Tulsa, Libraries are doing an outstanding job working with our Indian people. And as an advisory council member, a couple of weeks ago, we had a meeting to kind of finalize uh, today's activities. And they shared with us a video. And it's an outstanding video. It made us, uh, those of us that sit on the council, made us feel really, really good that uh, Tulsa County Public Libraries is going the extra effort, the extra mile, if you will, to promote our heritage, to promote our culture in, in such a positive way. So at this time, we're gonna show this latest video clip. Reading is important in every language. Tigalia. Hurakiriku. Kama. Rianye. Asoka Way Day. The Tulsa City County Library's American Indian Resource Center encourages everyone to read. I believe we have some of our stars that were just seen on the video. If you participate in that video, would you please stand or, or wave your hand so we can acknowledge you at this time? <laughs> Two over here. I believe that was Mr. Rob Ann Q and Patience Harjo, is that correct? All right, let's give them one more round of applause, please. That's great. Again, we want to encourage you uh, during the uh, question and answer portion of our program, uh, the index cards that were uh, handed out, we will ask you uh, respectfully to write your uh, question on the index card and we will read them uh, during the Q&A session. We were scheduled to have our Creek Nation fiddle dancers here with us uh, this morning, but I understand they had some, having some travel issues. All right. Without further ado, he needs no introduction. He also, too, is a, me a member of the American Indian Resource uh, Council for the Tulsa Public uh, City Libraries. Uh, he honored us this morning by opening up our breakfast with a wonderful Creek prayer. So. He's a wonderful, wonderful storyteller, and he happily, readily agreed to fill in uh, for the Creek Nation Fiddle Dancers. So let's give a round of applause to our good friend, your good friend, Mr. Will Hill, the good reverend. Good 
Gumagade Zistungo. Welcome to this morning, uh, this wonderful celebration of uh, one of my dearest heroes, literary heroes, Mr. Joseph Bruchek. Let's give him one more big round of applause for being here. In a story I know that he's probably heard a, a thousand times, and of course, I'll tell it in the way our people told it, the Muscogean people. And it begins like this. Gaju wali hey, yo wali hey. Gaju wali hey, yo wali hey. Can you guys clap with me? Gaju wali hey, yo wali hey. Gaju wali hey, yo wali hey. They say that one day the sun grew so hot that all the water dried up, all the streams and the lakes they dried up. There was not one drop of water that could be found. So all the animals got together and they said, we need a well. You guys say that. We need a well. Now all the great animals were called upon. For instance, Ijo, the deer, was called upon to use his antlers to plow into the earth. While other animals, such as the mole, who used to living in the soil, helped carry away the extra dirt. Everyone, let's make a mole right there. There he is, carrying away the extra dirt. Well now, when they came to Jukfi Holaje, that means the tricky rabbit. Everybody put your hands on top of your head like this. Stick your front teeth out and look at your neighbor and go, ah, blah, 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 ah, blah. Well now, when they asked him to help, this was his mean and selfish reply. Me? Help? Never. Now get my beautiful coat all dirty. You must find someone else. So, all the animals said, if you do not help dig this well, you will not have any of our water. So all the animals got together and they started digging that well as the rabbit danced off. Rabbits do not need your water. Bye. He went, e -e 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 -e, and he was gone. Well, now, all those animals started digging that well. Everybody put your paws up like this. And there they were digging that well. Pretty soon they hit an underground stream and life-sustaining, refreshing water started to fill up their little well. Well, all the animals were really happy. They all lined up to get a drink. When who should show up pinching and poking his way to the front of the line was Chukfi Hulaje, the tricky rabbit boy. And he brought with him a great big gourd cup. He prepared to dip it in when one of the animals caught him and they said, ah, don't you dare. Don't you dare take a drink of that water. You didn't help dig that well. You will not have any of our water. The rabbit said, fine. Rabbits don't need your water anyway. And off he ran. <coughs> he was gone. Well now, as the days went by, they noticed one strange and unusual thing. That as the animals passed through the animal villages, they noticed that the rabbit was not even thirsty. He did not even break a sweat. And one of those animals said, hey, I think that rabbit is stealing our water. Let's go see if it is so. So that night, all the animals hid in the tall grass. Everybody take your fingers and look like this. There they were looking through the tall grass when the stars and the moon appeared above the Appalachian mountain ranges. They heard a rustling in the underbrush. It was the rabbit and he was sneaking down to the well and he brought with him a great big gourd cup. He dipped it in and he took a great big swig and he went, <laughs> Those animals said, we knew it! That rabbit has been stealing our water. That rabbit must be punished. So they went to see the greatest of all rabbit fighters, a true captain of rabbit fighters. His name, the great Yaha, Ajulimaha, the great timber wolf. Now he was the great military leader, the great general of all the animal nations. And he came swaggering out as the great general he was, and this was his advice, he said. Well, if you want to fight a rabbit, First of all, you have to catch that rabbit. Now they knew that rabbits loved to slap, to punch, and to kick strangers. And this is where they would catch him. 
They would make this strange looking creature made of the stickiest honey gum. They would set it right there by the well. That night when the rabbit showed up, he would be walking into a trap. So they made this creature. They gave him a great big head. Everyone go, Two rocks for eyes. Everyone go, thump, thump. Rock for a nose. Go, beep. And then they gave him rocks for teeth. Everyone go, brrr. Then they gave him two tree branches for arms. And they set that sticky, gooey mess setting right there by the well where it looked looking like this. Look at your neighbor and go. So now, they waited. And that night, when the stars and the moon reappeared, all the animals waited, hiding in the tall grass. Everybody hide in the tall grass. The rabbit made his way down to the well, and there he started drinking. Only this time he brought with him an even bigger gourd cup. He dipped it in and he took a great big swig and he went Now he turned around and all of a sudden he was surprised by the creature. He looked and he went, Ooh, he laughed. He went, look at that. He said, I've never seen a creature like this before. And he's obviously never seen me, so I'll greet him in my native language. He said, his chair, stone go, stone is go, the but there was no reply. The creature only looked at him like this. So now, he said, maybe he doesn't speak that language. I'll try something else. He had see to hijan hina ushta. There was still no reply. So he tried another one. He said, uh, halito chikma chikbo fidi. There was still no reply. And, hmm. He said, I'll try Seminole. He said, Chentamo, Hidibichi, Mikchove. There was still no reply. And the rabbit got really angry. He said, You mustn't have a mama that taught you well. Whenever you greet another animal in the forest, you're supposed to greet them and reply. But for doing that, I'm going to punch you with my paw. So he pulled back with his paw and he swung. And that paw got stuck in that sticky, gooey mess. And he couldn't get it out. He went, hey, hey, let go. Hey, let go. I'm going to hit you with my other paw. And he swung and that paw got stuck. Now he was really stuck. Hey, let go. Let go. He pulled back with his hind leg and he swung. And that hind leg got stuck. Well, now. All the animals started coming out of their hiding places. They said, aha, now we've caught you. What should we do with this water thief? And one of them said, I know. Let's chop him up and make him into rabbit sandwiches. What do you guys say? And all the animals said, yeah. You guys say that? Yeah. Well, now, the rabbit thinking very quickly said, no. And they said, why? Why shouldn't we do this? He said, because every piece you slice off will become a brand new rabbit. He said, oh, well, we don't want to do that. And the rabbit said, I thought so. Another one said, I know. Let's throw him into a great big cooking pot and make him into some rabbit stew. What do you guys say? Yeah. And the rabbit thinking very quickly said, no. And they said, why? He said, because you know the hot water will only make my coat clean. And you know how much I love to be clean. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. He said, no, no. He said, I know, said another. He said, uh, how can we punch you? How can we punish you? This is exactly what the rabbit wanted. So now, they all got together. With the rabbit thinking very quickly, he said, there's one thing, sticker bushes. I hate sticker bushes. Don't throw me in. Well, now the animals were so bent on punishing rabbit, they forgot about this. So now they grabbed the rabbit. They said, there's a stick of bush, and we're going to throw you in it. The rabbit said, oh, no, don't do that. And they began to count. They said, Hungan, Hokolan, Duchinen, Austin, Os. And they tossed the rabbit, and the rabbit went twirling through the air. He hit on one side of the stick of bushes, and he disappeared. And all the animals were waiting 
They hear his cries of agony and his screams of grief, but nothing came, only silence. And the rabbit rolled harmlessly to the other side and started teasing the animals. He said, rabbits live in thicker bushes, you sillies. So now, the lesson of the story is this. Grandma would say, you know, it's always good to be helpful. Never be lazy, but never let people tell you exactly what you want to hear. That's the way it was, and that's the way it will be. And at the end of each story, the people would all say, oh, can you guys say that? Oh. Now look at your neighbor and go, oh. oh. And your other neighbor go, oh. oh. Thank you, Mado. Right. This is really wonderful. I really had a great, wonderful time looking for Teresa up there. Do we still keep going? Uh, one more story. Would you guys like to hear one more story? Yes. Okay. This is about a character by the name of the Jupko Ingi. I want you guys to take your paws like this, take your claws like this, and look at your neighbor and go, uh, Look at your other name and go, uh. Now this is a monster story. They say at one time along the great Mississippi, known to our people as the Weagofki, it means the muddy waters, the British and the Americans would know this river as the great Mississippi. There was a creature known as the Jupko Ingi. He was rotten, he was terrible. Most of all, he loved to make others frightened. And because of his looks, let me describe you describe him to you. They say that he had the head of a shrimp. Everybody take your fingers like this and make some shrimp eyes up here. There we go. And then he had the body of an armadillo. And for those of you visiting us for the first time, if you don't know what an armadillo looks like, he kind of looks like a little pig in armor. And then he had a great big fan tail like a lobster's tail. And everybody shake your tails right there. Was, there we go. And then he had these huge claws, hence the name the long claw. Now let's click them together like castanets. So now, in this story, he loved to frighten others. For instance, he couldn't be happier if he saw someone crying because he scared them. For instance, if he saw a group of baby animals playing down by the river, he couldn't be happy unless he scared them. The babies could be down there playing by themselves. And along came the long claw, and he would go, Ugh! and those babies, they would start crying. They would go, and the old time animals would get onto the long claw, and they would say, long claw, where is the corner? Stop making those babies cry. But the long claw would say these terrible things that no one should ever say. And he would say, because he would get very offended, he would go, you're not my mother, you're not my father, you can't tell me what to do, you're not the boss of me. Well now, he kept doing this until one day, it happened this way, there were a group of squirrels down by the great river, they were playing in the water, splashing about, taking pecan shells and getting drinks and throwing the water on each other. The squirrels were having a good time. But then again, squirrels just want to have fun. And so there they were, splashing in the water, going, squirrels just want to have fun. Squirrels just want to have fun. Ah, ah. Well now, along came the long claw. And he snuck up behind them and he went, <laughs> they don't even know that I'm here. <laughs> Maybe I should scare these squirrels. What do you guys say? You think I ought to scare these squirrels? Yes. What? Yes. Huh? Yes. Who said no? Who said it? Did you say no? Eh, what do you know? <laughs> so now he snuck up behind those animals and he went, and the squirrels just let out a big scream. They went, ah! 
and the long cloth that was so funny he started laughing. <laughs> And the squirrels, when they realized who it was, they got really angry. And they said, Long Claw, we should have known it was you. One of these days, bucko, someone's going to take you down to size. And the Long Claw said, Oh, yeah? You're not my mother. You're not my father. You can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. That'll be the day to run along, short britches. Your mama's calling you. And so now off he went in. Nobody wanted to play with him anymore. So he made his way around the great rivers until he came upon the wonders of wonders. There was a huge mound of clay and mud, and on top of it was a creature known to our people as the Gunu. Now the Gunu was on top, and it scratched a hole in the soft clay and mud, filled it full of water and was taking tiny fishing nets and throwing them out into the river where it was catching tiny minnows and fishes to take it back to trade for its funny, its most favorite of all foods, honeycombs. Everyone say, yum, yum. yum, yum. <coughs> well now, the long claw had never seen a creature like this before. He said, hey, I've never seen anything like this before. Hmm, and maybe they've never seen me. That gives me... Pause to think, what could I do? So while he was thinking about what to do to this creature, I will describe this creature for you. Maybe you have seen a guno. Now they say the guno looks kind of like a cat. It's short, squat, and it's got a rectangular shaped head, and it's all black with a great big bushy tail, but it has a white stripe that runs from the tip of its nose to the bottom of its tail. Can anyone tell me what that is? A skunk, that's right. He'd never seen a skunk before, that's right! Never seen one before, so he said, hey, I got the idea. Maybe I should scare this creature. What do you guys say? You think I ought to scare this creature? Yes! What? Yes! Huh? Who said no? Did you say no? Stand up. What do you know? So now, he snuck up behind the gunnel, the skunk, and with all his might, he scared, tried to scare the creature, and he went, Ugh! And the skunk only looked back at the creature, that long claw, and went. But the long claw kept on going. And the skunk finally had enough. The skunk raised its claws and went. And the long claw took off, running, got off by itself, and said, well, that didn't go quite as well as I thought it would. Maybe I should try it again. What do you guys say? You think I gotta try it again? Yes. What? Yes. Huh? Yes. Who said no? Did you guys say no? Stand up. All you guys that said no, stand up. Eh, what do you guys know? <laughs> Sit down. So now he snuck up behind the, the skunk one more time. And he went, <laughs> he went, boo, boo, be afraid, be very afraid, boo, 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 boo. And finally the skunk had enough and whirled around and said, why are you bothering me? Don't you see I'm working here? I am working here. And the long class said, right, I, I and the skunk said, now go away and haunt someone else, you, you little weirdo. And the long claw said, little weirdo, who are you calling a little weirdo? And the skunk said, I'm calling you a little weirdo. And the long claw said, hey, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my mother. You're not my father. You can't tell me what to do. You obviously don't know who I am. 
And the skunk said, well, who are you then? He said, I am the long claw, scariest creature of the great Mississippi. You should be afraid, very afraid. And the long claw said, well, then who are you? I've never heard of you before. And the skunk said, I am Gunno the skunk. And if you don't quit messing with me, I'm going to show you the power of the skunk. And the long claw said, the power of the skunk. Ooh, I'm scared. He said, that sounds like a challenge to me. You see this great big claw? Don't you realize I could bring it right down on your little pea head? And the skunk said, bring it on. Bring it. Well, now he said, you asked for it, said the long claw. He pulled his great big claw back. He swung with all his might, leaning into the weight of his claw. He closed his little eyes so tight on his head that as the great claw passed toward the skunk, the skunk was really fast and agile. He dove right underneath that great big claw just as it passed over. And before it disappeared with his hind legs, he slapped it with his hind legs. But now to the long claw, his eyes closed. He felt like he had hit the skunk right on the head. And when he finished his pass, Will Skunk had rolled into the hole that it had dug and was hiding in there. Well now, the long claw opened his two little eyes and all he saw was the hole in the ground. He thought he had hit the skunk so hard he went right into the ground like a, a screw would go into a board and he began to laugh. <laughs> I told him not to mess with me. You were there. You heard it. But now I have to see the grizzly remains. So now he took his two long stemmed eyes. He stuck them into the hole where the skunk had disappeared. Stuck his head right in there. And all of a sudden he was met by the skunk's great big bushy tail. It began to bristle and stand up. And the, the long claw put his nose right on it like this. And he went... Hey, I've never seen anything like this before. What's going to happen next? And with one mighty blast, the skunk let him have it and went. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the long claw went. <laughs> that blast was so powerful that his two little eyes fell off their stems like this. Boink, boink. And his great big claws rolled off. And he sank into his armor and went, oh, you got me. What a world. What a world. Well, now, he was gone. And the skunk took his two long claws and took them home, washed them up and turned them into little fruit bowls where they have remained on his table since that time. The lesson of the story is this. Always remember when you act out and misbehave, it might be cute for a little while, but remember, you're asking for attention. Make sure you don't get the wrong kind of attention. And always remember, there's something faster than yourself. That's the way it was, and that's the way it will be. And at the end of each story, they would all say, Oh! Can you guys say that? Oh. Now look at your neighbor and go, Ow! Oh. And your other neighbor go, Ow! Oh. Oh. Thank you. Oh. Let's give Reverend Will Hill another round of applause. He is always very entertaining, <laughs> informative, and that is truly an art, native storytelling. Thank you, Reverend. We've come to that point of our program, ladies and gentlemen, where we are ready to present this wonderful award to this wonderful human being. And uh, a little explanation about this outstanding award. The American Indian Festival of Words Writers Award recognizes written contributions of outstanding American Indian authors, poets, journalists, film and stage script writers. It is the first and only award given by a public library to honor an American Indian writer. The award is given in odd number of years. Recipients receive a $5,000 cash prize, which is sponsored by the Maxine and Jack Zero Family Foundation. And let's give the Maxine and Jack Zero Family Foundation a round of applause at this time for that wonderful contribution. 
We're going to have our American Indian Resource uh, Center Rider Selection member, Ms. Shonda Harmon, and Ms. Indian Oklahoma Jordan Harmon, and Junior Miss Indian Oklahoma Lindsay Harjo to come to the stage at this time, please. <laughs> Mr. Bruchak holds a BA in English from Cornell University, an MA in Literature and Creative Writing from Syracuse and a PhD in Comparative Literature from the Union Institute of Ohio. His poems, articles, and stories have appeared in well over 500 publications from National Geographic and American Poetry Review to the Smithsonian Magazine. His honors include a Rockefeller Humanities Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Writing Fellowship for Poetry, the Cherokee National Prose Award, among others. In 1999, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of this year's American Indian Festival, Festival Awards, Writers Awards, Mr. Joseph Bruchak. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to ask you if you're able to rise, to rise at this time. And we're going to go to our drum for an appropriate honor song for Mr. Joseph Bruchak. Thank you, singers. You may be seated. Um, he's going to speak for about 15 minutes or so, or whatever is on his heart and his mind. And then after that, um, we're going to have the uh, question and answer session. Kwai 
על הסלטורי, על הנביא זומביק, תארום בוואט זוהק. ואבנקי על האלנו בא עונדה, וליוני נידו בא, וליוני. Hello my friends, you all appear new to me. And that's what we say to people we know and people we've met for the first time. My name is Joseph, or the Peaceful One. I am from our land, or the place we call the Medicine Spring Place, the place we call the White Mountains of the Adirondacks. I am of the Wabanaki people, a human being, and I give you thanks. Those words in the Abenaki language. I'd like to begin by acknowledging those who helped me reach this point in my career where I've been chosen to receive an award such as this, but I can't because I did it all myself. I'm awesome. That's a joke. <laughs> I gotta do that or I'm gonna start crying because this is such a moving experience, you know. Ah, kik ta spem kik squida ta nebis, wan ta kitsi ulioni, ulidogongan, kitsi ulioni. How very small I am. I give thanks to earth and sky, to fire and water, to air and to earth. It's such an honor to receive this here in this place in the presence of so many that I respect, so many that I love, many of whom deserve to be up here as much as I do, or maybe more. Some of whom I only recognize here in spirit because their bodies have already passed from this earth. People like Greg or Donnie or Vine Delore or Bob Conley, Louis Little Coon Oliver of Tahlequah, his Muskogee people, a beloved elder who passed in 1992 and was always teaching me things. 1992 is the same year that I was privileged to be in Oklahoma for an epic gathering of more than 300 American Indian authors. It was called Returning the Gift, an event that I had a small part in bringing to birth. I love my work. I love this work of writing, this work of storytelling. And thinking of storytelling, wasn't Will Hill incredible? Give him another round of applause, man. It's one of the best things about my life that I get to meet people like Will and hear their work and hear drummers like these whose hearts are so clearly in their music. Be able to touch the mind or the spirit of another person, that's true magic. Is it ironic for me who's a writer to say it goes beyond words? You know, people often have told me I could not do this. They told me not just through rejecting what I wrote. I mean, my first book called Indian Mountain was rejected over 20 times before it was published. A book of mine called Keepers of the Earth, close to 100 refusal letters before it finally saw print. I was told I was too stupid, too ignorant, too naive, that all the important books had already been written. And anyway, who wants to hear about Indians? <laughs> so why try? And who the heck are Abenakis? Never heard of them. Did you just make up that name? <laughs> I carry an old tribal enrollment card in my wallet. Abenaki Nation of Vermont, it reads across the top. And lower down below a photograph of myself that's 36 years old, has a lot more hair on it. The words, St. Francis Sokoki Band, number 3312. Back then, after a brief period of state recognition, our Western Abenaki people had no status legally. Although our chief, then Homer St. Francis, said, that's all right, because I don't recognize the United States government anyway. <laughs> I've always felt honored that my writing and my storytelling, my family's work in renewing and strengthening our indigenous language, the work we've done in repatriating the bones of our elders, the work we've done in things like fish-in trials, where later on I got to testify as a writer and an expert witness as a storyteller, <laughs> played a little part in raising public awareness and supporting, in supporting our Abenaki people, especially our young people. And today, there's not one but four tribal nations of Abenakis who enjoyed legislative recognition, the Missisquoi, the Nolhegan, the Kawasuk, and the Elnu Bands. I think of them and I accept what I receive here today in part for them. You know, I was brought up poor by my grandparents on the Indian side. They ran a little general store 
where they gave credit to everyone. <laughs> there was sort of like a, a mini trust for <laughs> everybody in the neighborhood. When my grandfather died, I think he was owed about $40,000, which was a lot of money. But I never saw so many people come to someone's funeral. My grandmother used to make my shirts out of chicken feed sacks. She made her aprons out of them, too. And uh, I never had a television or saw a TV until after fifth grade. Kids say, oh, so did you watch your movies on your phone? Uh, yeah, uh -huh, that's right. <laughs> my grandfather, Jesse Elmer Bowman, and by the way, he hated that middle name. <laughs> He told me how he left school in fourth grade, jumped out the window of the one-room schoolhouse because they kept calling him a dirty Indian. He went to work in the woods for Seneca Smith. He could barely read and write, but he was unfailingly kind. Never struck me because that was how he said he was raised. He was so dark-skinned that the one time he went down south to Virginia, he was forced to use the colored bathrooms. I heard it said of him in our hometown, Jesse Bowman is black as an Abenaki. That may give you an idea of what it was like to be a native person in many parts of the Northeast. But he taught me to read, not books, but the land and the garden where I still grow the three sisters of corn and beans of squash that he grew. He taught me the woods. And my grandmother, who was a highly literate woman, had a house that was just filled with books. It's almost four years now since the person who loved and tolerated me more than anyone else in the world has also left. My wife of 47 years, Carol. The strength and kindness of our two grown sons, Jim and Jesse Bruchak, Jesse Bowman Bruchak, named after my grandfather. They're both writers and they're both professional storytellers and their best qualities come from her. My co-editor, my partner, my best, my most unfailingly honest critic. We grew into our marriage and we grew up together. And when we had to mortgage our house to pay off the debts for the Returning the Gift Conference, uh, we'd raised $350,000 for that conference and we spent $400,000, a typical Indian success story. <laughs> she didn't bat an eye about that. It was Carol who on our 30th wedding anniversary said, thank you for 15 wonderful years. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. Some of you were lucky enough to know her. The last word she spoke to me when we were together was this. She took her hand in mine, held it tightly with both her hands, and she said, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. So what could I do except continue on as I'm here today? And so I accept this award in honor of all of us who write what others tell us we can't write and we shouldn't do. I accept it in honor of my Abenaki people, elders like Madawalasis, Little Loon, Atian Lolo, Stephen Laurent, who taught me language and story. In honor of my late wife, who I'll miss and yet feel with me for all the rest of my life. In honor of earth and sky. In honor of all who breathe. I thank you. Beautiful words, beautiful commentary. Let's give Mr. Bruchak one more round of applause. Again, this is the, uh, I guess, last call for questions, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Larry Bartley to begin the 10-minute uh, question and answer portion of our program. All right, our first question. Mr. Bruchak, yes. you ready? I guess I will be. Okay. As a child, what was your favorite book that you read? I guess it had to be The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. I read it years again later, and uh, I discovered it was really a book about colonialism as much as it was about a boy who was uh, raised by wolves. And in many ways, it tells a story that I think all indigenous people can understand. So it's still a favorite book of mine, The Jungle Book. <laughs> Is Skeleton Man an actual Indian story? Uh, Skeleton Man is one of my novels. It's a novel about a girl whose parents disappear and then she 
begins to put two and two together and ties it into her mind with this traditional tale of a, a monster who was a human being and because he uh, was so greedy and selfish, ended up eating himself and turning into a, a cannibal monster. Uh, that story exists in the Mohawk language. I first heard it in Mohawk and have it written down in Mohawk. It's called chik chik which is the sound those dry bones make rubbing against each other. And it's a wonderful story that teaches us the importance of, of kindness and sharing and working hard and being part of your community and not just being someone who takes advantage of others and is greedy and selfish. Because greed and selfishness always turn you into a monster. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are, that happens, and we see it all the time. Yeah, that's a traditional story. When did you start writing, and was it your original career? Well, my original career was to be a naturalist. I always wanted to work with animals, because I had great love and still do for the natural world. My grandfather brought me that, I think. I mean, he taught me that when you catch a fish, you always have to say thank you to it. And uh, this is the way he did it. So uh, that was what I first wanted to be. And I, I was writing about animals and plants and things like that when I was in grade school. I was writing these little essays and poems and writing things for my teacher and getting in trouble with the other kids and my teachers praised me too much. I was the little kid with big thick glasses who always got beat up for a long time. You've worked on several books and a documentary on native Oklahoma and Jim Thorpe. Oh, yeah. Tell us a few stories or interesting facts about Jim that we may not know. Oh my God, I love Jim Thorpe so much. It's just, oh, what an what amazing person. Not just because of his athletic ability, but because of the way he lived his life. His son Jack told me, and I interviewed Jack as part of uh, writing the book and doing the film, that one day his dad gave a talk in this uh, school and got paid $20 for it. They walked outside and a man walked up to Jim and said, uh, Jim, I'm down on my luck, can you help me? And Jim Thorpe opened up his wallet and took out that $20 and put another $5 on top of it and gave it to the guy who took it and said thank you and walked off. And Jack said, I said to my father, who was that, Pop? And Jim Thorpe said, well, I don't know. Why'd you give him all our money? Well, he said he needed it. That was the kind of person Jim Thorpe was. I have a friend named Swift Eagle who was a, actually Swifty taught me that flute song I started off with. It's called The Song of the Wind. It's a Pueblo song. First song I ever learned on the flute 40 years ago, 45 years ago now, I'm getting old. And uh, Swifty worked, he went to Hollywood to work in the movies. He was from uh, Santa Domingo Pueblo and he was a flute player. And Jim Thorpe heard him playing the flute in the Hollywood Bowl and said, you want to come and work in the movies? Because Jim was in scouting people and also working as bit parts himself in many films. So he brought Swifty on to the lot and said, can you shoot a bow and arrow? And Swifty said, oh yeah, I never miss, which was true. He was an incredible archer. So Jim said, well, if I give you a bow, can you string it? Swifty said, I think I can. And Jim Thorpe gave him his own bow. And this bow was so strong, almost nobody could string it, but Swifty just went, wrapped his leg around, strung the bow. Jim said, good. Now, can you hit something if I give you an arrow? Sure I can. Can you hit a person? Well, if I hit a person, I'll kill him. Jim said, don't worry, this guy's a stunt man. He'll, he'll jump out of the way before the arrow hits him. So you stand right here, so Swifty stood there. Now, see that door way down there, about 100 feet away? I'm gonna go over there and tell him to stick out his body, and then you shoot at him, he'll jump back. So Swifty said, okay, he better be quick though. So Jim Thorpe disappears behind the door. He says, you ready? Swifty goes, I am ready. And this guy leans out, Swifty boom, hits the guy right in the chest. The guy falls down. Oh, no. Swifty drops the boat, runs up, and Jim Thorpe is there in the doorway laughing. And there's a dressmaker's dummy with an arrow in it. <laughs> Jim was a great practical joker. Back when he was at Carlisle, when everybody was lined up and he was one of the heads of the cadets, he would walk behind them and he'd have like, you know, a rotten tomato in his hand, he'd stick it in the guy's hand while he's standing like this at attention. Stuck there like this with a rotten tomato in his hand. He was a person who was a, a wonderful role model in a lot of ways, a man who loved life and loved to have fun and uh, always thought about others before he thought of himself, which is why he died poor, but well loved. And, uh, I, anything I can do to help people remember who Jim Thorpe was, I'm going to do it because he's a man whose memory should live forever.
And one more thing, I hope you'll give support to the efforts that are going on right now to repatriate his body. Because he, after he died, his third wife, against his wishes, against the wishes of the Sac and Fox Nation, who were engaged in a traditional burial ceremony, they came and grabbed his body, took it away, and then she literally went around the country to find somebody who would pay her to have that, her husband, Jim Thorpe, buried there, and they named their town after him. That's what Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, did. So he's buried there, didn't want to be there. Jack, his son, worked for years to try to get him returned home. And uh, anything you can do, anything you hear about, you can write a letter to your congressperson, uh, you know, support repatriation efforts because Jim Thorpe should come home to Oklahoma. How do your Indian books and stories fit into your studies of, of comparative literature? Well, I always, I lived in Africa for three years as a volunteer teacher, and I always say going to Africa taught me a lot about being an American, because I really saw things I hadn't seen clearly before, and I saw how important the extended family was, how important elders were, how children were raised, I saw how community was so strong, and I realized that that was what I saw in native communities, in Indian communities here in this country. So I find when I, uh, there are many ways in which we as human beings are alike and there are ways in which we're different, but we're all part of that same circle. And I think that studying comparative literature shows us different points on that circle where we can see ourselves and also learn to see others. What do you keep in mind when you write? I always think about the story the story itself. And when I feel the story, it kind of tells itself to me. I know when you're in the middle of telling a story, you're not really thinking ahead about what's going to happen next. You're just in that story and it's kind of telling itself to you. And I try to give myself to the story when I'm in the process of writing it to be true to the story and uh, not to be uh, confused by, oh, I don't know, all those things that people get confused by, especially forgetting to be kind, forgetting to be respectful, uh, forgetting to remember that we need to listen. When writing a novel, how do you know when to write in first person or third person? Is there a difference when you write for your people or for young people or adults? You know, it's funny, I, I don't really think about that consciously. I just let the story happen. And sometimes it, the character turns up to have such a strong voice, like Jim Thorpe's voice is so strong, I had to tell his book in first person. And other times you find like you're, you're watching a story take place. And as far as whether it's for young people or for adults, I just feel like I write for human beings. And sometimes I may keep the language a little simpler and a little clearer if I'm writing for younger readers, but I don't ever try to write down to anybody. Because I think you need to respect uh, young people just as you would respect any people. They're, they're worthy of the best we can give them. Do you think Crazy Horse's vision was authentic? Well, I worked with um, people from the Lakota Nation, and the illustrator, S.D. Nelson, is himself a descendant of Crazy Horse's clan. And uh, he and I went over the manuscript together and over the story together, and he said he felt it was legitimately the story that uh, tells how Crazy Horse had the great vision that led to his uh, gaining his name. So as far as I, I know, and whenever I've written something that doesn't deal with, say, Abenaki or with my family or with my community directly, I always turn to people who are from that community and ask for their input in the process of research, in the process of writing, and well before it gets published. So that um, when I wrote a novel about the Navajo code talkers, I worked with code talkers themselves. And I sent the manuscript to the Navajo Code Talkers Association before it got published. I sent it to Harry Walters, who was the head of the Diné College Museum. I sent it to several people like, um, who, are, who are linguists in the language and spoke in Navajo and were Navajo themselves. So, that's what I try to do. And admittedly, anybody can make mistakes. And if I ever make a mistake in my writing, I want people to let me know and, and show me what I can do to uh, correct that mistake. Do you publish books? Uh, in 1970, uh, I came back from West Africa and published my first book by other people, which was a collection of writing smuggled out of a prison. And uh, ever since then, I've been publishing on a small scale. My wife, Carol, and I were the publishers, really. In fact, I published Leslie Silko's first book, which was a book of poetry. 
And uh, I've published a number of people who went on to be pretty famous writers in their early stages of their career. And I feel really proud of that. And I've done anthologies of Native American poetry. In fact, a very funny thing happened to me about a year ago. I was at this conference with my friend uh, Sherman Alexi. And Sherman's up there talking. He says, I'm glad to see Joe in the audience because he's the reason I'm a writer. I go, Uh, what he said, when, well, it was because he read an anthology that I edited of American Indian poetry called Songs on Earth on Turtle's Back when he was a college student. He said, and he suddenly realized when he read that book that he could write about real things that were Indian, not just all this kind of stuff that is stereotyped and untrue. He said it was a great inspiration to him. So, you know, I thank Sherman for that, but uh, Sherman's a lot better writer than anything I could have done to influence him. And our final question is, who or what inspired you to dare or take the risk of writing down your dreams? I think that I was most inspired uh, by my grandparents, who told me to follow my dreams and to listen to my dreams, and uh, who would always ask me what I dreamt at night. And I learned later that was a tradition a lot of people have around the world. For example, when I was in Mexico among the Mayan people back in 92, 93, um, every morning, the elder of the village, Chan Keen, who was 130 years old, would say, everybody tell me your dreams. Then we'd tell our dreams, and then he would talk about what they meant. And I think if we listen to our dreams, if we're writers, if we write down our dreams, it's this incredible resource. And who knows where it comes from? All I know is that I'm glad that it does come. And I'm glad that I've had an opportunity to share a little with you all today. Thanks to each and every one of you who submitted questions. And a round of applause for uh, Larry Bartley for moderating the question and answer session. Thank you, Larry. A driving force behind this festival, uh, this very successful festival. Uh, she wasn't in here earlier, but uh, we need to recognize her at this time, and that is Miss Teresa Reynolds. Teresa, come on up. Thank you for coming today. Um, I hope you enjoyed our author. He will be signing books afterwards. Barnes & Noble will have a stand up to buy books if you want. We also have a poster that they're free. You can grab one and maybe he can sign it as well or something. When you came in, you should have received a program and then a brochure. We have a three-hour festival of words going on. It's a free festival. We have um, Native culture maker spaces in there. We have a canoe. We have um, children's crafts. We have the Iways um, Gray Snow Eagle program coming. They're going to do two presentations. And we have the Muscogee Nation fiddle dancers are here. And then we will finish it all off with Mike and Lisa Positopa in... Um, a dance presentation. So please enjoy the day. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs>